Okay, thank you everyone for joining today. We're gonna to go ahead and get started. Um, really excited to uh, have this webinar today. It's a unique event for us here at Akoya, um, kind of a new format, so we're giving this a try. Um, so please uh, be forgiving to us um, with this format. Um, and we're very much uh, want to encourage open discussion. If you have questions, um, please feel free to, to raise your hand and, and uh, unmute yourself. Um, and we can ask them out loud, or if you want to just put them into the Q&A on the screen, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, I would just ask you to please refrain from putting them in the chat if possible, um, and we'll go ahead and, and do it like that. Um, we do have uh, three of our neuroscientists from the Akoya team with us today, Agnes, Oliver, and Najiba, who all have uh, unique areas of expertise that they're going to share with us. Um, they prepared short presentations just to kind of uh, set the stage for the discussion, um, and we'll go through each of those. But the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to start off uh, with just a couple survey questions, um, and uh, just to help us understand a little bit about what you, about you and, and your interests. And so um, let me uh, just pull one of those up now and feel free to, to answer your questions here. And so let me go ahead and choose the first survey. Um, let me launch this one out there. Okay. So we're kind of curious if, if folks had a chance to um, catch the, the, the on-demand webinars that we, we held previously, and I see those results coming in right now. All right. Great. It looks like we've got a mixed bag. You know, some folks were able to, to uh, connect and see John Cherry. Um, and then, uh, and then also, uh, some, some saw both. So that's great. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and I would encourage you if you didn't get to catch those on demand webinars, they are available still. Um, so feel free to go back to akoyabio.com. And, uh, we, as always, any of these webinars that we're showing, uh, we like to have, keep them on demand so you can look at them afterwards. Um, the one that happened, I know with Dr. Fan was uh, was hosted during uh, China Standard Time, so it wasn't as convenient for the folks here in the Americas. Um, you know, so feel free to go check that one out. It was it was a really good one. Okay, so I have one more. I have a couple more here that I'd like to to put out there for you guys. And here, let me ask this next question here. We are curious about um, the type of work that you do. If you wouldn't mind sharing that with us. Interesting. All right. That's, you know, that's sort of what we expected to see. Um, it looks like everyone voting so far is, uh, is working both in Brightfield and fluorescence. Um, so that's good to hear. And we weren't sure if, if there would be many folks coming into this one today, it would be pure Brightfield. Um, we don't see very many pure fluorescence out there. Uh, so this is good to know. Well, I appreciate, um, appreciate the answers to that one. And I have one more question before I turn it over to Agnes, uh, who's going to give a short presentation. And let me launch this, this one here right now. That's, uh, we're curious about autofluorescence. And so let me launch this poll. This is a simple yes, no question for you guys. All right. It looks like folks do indeed deal with autofluorescence in some way, shape or form. Um, we suspected that and uh, this is good. So I think this will lead us nicely into some of the things that Agnes will share with us for her presentation. Um, thank you guys for, for sharing uh, the feedback on this. Um, I've got a couple more that we'll queue up later on in the talk. Um, but again, what I would like to encourage, you know, we did sort of pitch this as ask me anything. Um, you know, we would like to have an open discussion. So um, if you have questions for any of our presenters while they're giving their talk, um, just raise your hand and uh, I will unmute you and you can go ahead and ask your question. And, and like I said, feel free to interrupt. We want to have an open dialogue. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Agnes. Agnes, go ahead, take it away. Thank you, Dan. I'm gonna share my screen here. And just before I get started on this presentation, I just wanna give you guys a little bit of background on myself, introduce myself a little bit. I did my uh, graduate work and training in neuroscience and bioengineering at the University of Pittsburgh. And I spent about the past 10 years studying traumatic spinal cord and brain injury, and as well as peripheral nerve injury. 
using a variety of different imaging techniques, biomaterials, stem cells, um, as well as different behavioral uh, trainings and assessments as well. And I joined Akoya about a year and a half ago. And today I'm gonna talk to you about multispectral imaging. So our more high throughput, uh, medium content multiplexed for translational work. So it's our Phenoptics pro uh, platform. And the Phenoptics platform, if you guys are unaware, Akoya is a combination of the Codex technology, which came out of Gary Nolan's lab at Stanford. And this is our very high content uh, discovery based platform. And Oliver is going to talk a little bit about that in a bit. And then the quantitative pathology solutions from Perkin Elmer, which is our Phenoptics platform. And that's based on multispectral imaging and the liquid crystal tunable filter technology um, out of CRI. So we think that these two platforms come together for a very nice uh, continuum from discovery to translation. And uh, I'm especially excited to see them being adapted into the neuroscience field because it's a traditionally coming from the immuno oncology field. So with that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about multispectral imaging as well as our Phenoptics platform and how we think that it fits well into um, neuroscience. So if you think about traditional fluorescent imaging and uh, most of you are working with some level of fluorescent imaging, whether it's just a single GFP or like whenever I was doing traditional imaging, I was doing three colors plus DAPI. So the results are not really quantifiable. If you do five colors, you can do pretty much okay as long as you are not looking at your super low expressors because you have some overlap at the bottom, but you can threshold yourself with narrow band filters to capture about five before you start getting limitations. But whenever you start looking at something like nine, all of a sudden it gets very jumbled here in the middle and you can't really quantify these overlaps um, without losing the majority of your signal. And then, your, and then your confidence in these signals becomes weaker and weaker. So what we call it, we say that these results aren't quantifiable without unmixing. And what do I mean by that? So essentially you lose this section between five and 600 this is where a lot of these floors lie and overlap. This is also where you have a lot of traditional autofluorescence contributing to signal. So our solution to that, or one of the ways we deal with that is through multispectral imaging. And multispectral imaging is essentially adding a second filter above your emission filter, which is our liquid crystal tunable filter. This is one way that we do it. And what that means is it then takes snapshots for each color along the entire visible spectrum at different intervals. It creates this three-dimensional data cube where you have now lambda sections as well as your XY coordinates. And then our software will go forward to do some linear unmixing based on their pure admission spectra. And this is how we get, we end up with this pseudo color composite of our unmixed components on a pixel by pixel basis. And what does that look like? So here, if I want to know if a pixel is actually coming from my, from my green um, spectra here, I would go in and take these different snapshots all along the spectra. And then when I look at them together mathematically, I can be certain that that color is actually, uh, the intensity that we're reading out is actually from this spectra and not a combination of some other ones, because this is the only one that has this unique shape and signature. If it was a combination, it would have some kind of mathematical average between the two spectra and that would be uh, linear un linearly unmixed as well. So our technology does this in three different components. So first we have our opal reagents, which Najiba is going to talk a little bit about um, why they're especially suited to this, but essentially they peak at specific wavelengths. And the vector Polaris has uh, our filter cubes, which the Polaris is our imaging, our high throughput imager. And it has filter cubes that match up very closely with our opals. And then we have our inform software, which actually does the unmixing of each of these. So you can see as we go through an image, you have different combinations of our signals being picked up by our different filters. And that's what this represents here on the vector Polaris um, horizontal. And then whenever you have, whenever you process this through inform, 
it can very accurately pull those signals apart and know which antigen is actually attributing to those signals. So this allows you to have high confidence in your data, and it also allows you to have very clean data. And the technology allows you to capture the autofluorescence signal of your tissue as well, and then put that into its own channel. So if I know in some cases, people actually want to analyze the autofluorescence separately, and you're able to do that because you're not doing something like quenching it out or getting rid of it, you're just separating it out as if it's its own uh, spectral signature. And it actually makes a big difference. So if you look at, this is an image um, from Dr. Huber's lab at Boston University, where you can see this is our raw image and it looks pretty beautiful. Um, and if you look at the raw image to the spectrally unmixed, uh, by the naked eye, it, you can see that it has increased in clarity. And also there's a lot of this autofluorescence contribution to specific signals, but it looks fairly good. But whenever you actually go ahead and, and measure the signal to noise ratio and the accuracy of the phenotyping, you see that it kind of makes a huge difference. You're getting, especially in these, look at this 480 and 520 channel, 14 to one and 41 to one is still a, a fairly decent signal to noise ratio, but now it's going up to almost perfect. Essentially 999 means that there's zero background. And so it makes a huge difference across the entire spectrum whenever you're able to uh, accurately put these different signals into their own bin, as well as remove autofluorescence. And you can see this even in our 780 channel, which is far red. And I know most of us think of this as our most beautiful, you know, zero background channel. But these things, this little bit of haze that you see around your different, um, around your different nuclei, as well as the contributing autofluorescence actually makes for some, uh, some decent sized mistakes whenever you're using automated and machine learning based algorithms. And what happens is if you're kind of losing these low expressors, in this case, this is a lung cancer tissue, and you can see that quite a few, almost half of our cytokeratin positive or our tumor cells are being attributed to our other category, which means that our algorithm doesn't have enough confidence in order to attribute it to our cytokeratin. And this is just an example of a nine color image that you can acquire with Vector Polaris. And you can see as each one comes in, it's very specific, it's a single cell resolution, and you can get multiple markers on a single cell. So with this approach, we reliably image nine colors, they're non-overlapping, and we can remove autofluorescence from the tissue. We also have our inform machine learning software where we do things like tissue segmentation. It has this really nice um, pseudo hematoxylin and pseudo dab so that when you're doing cell segmentation, you can be very confident. It's much easier for me to look at a uh, pseudo hematoxylin and do cell segmentation than to look at a DAPI signal. It does uh, single and complex phenotyping. We have an RStudio plugin that will do spatial interactions as well as touching cells. So really the question I wanna ask you today is how are you maximizing your data? You have these precious tissue samples. You've already put a ton of work into gathering them, making sure whether you're working with humans, non-human primates, rodents, um, you've already put in sometimes on the order of months or years into a tissue sample, or if it's a precious human sample, it's very limited. So in this case, this would be a seven color image, a raw image coming off the vector Polaris. And then after unmixing, you already see the increase in clarity and removal of autofluorescence. Our inform software does our phenotyping of these cells of interest. And then our RStudio plugin is able to do these different spatial interactions and how these cells are interacting with one another. And in the future, we have our Proxima software. It's just been released, but the, th this will encompass all three of these steps in the future. And it's our image management platform that allows for very fast um, collaboration and unmixing of samples and sharing with colleagues. If, you, if any of you were on our uh, call earlier this week, we had a webinar on it. And you're also able to check out Proxima today if you would like. You can go to our website. There's this Explore Proxima button, which will allow you to uh, go through a demo of our Proxima site. 
So that's kind of the overview that I wanted to give everyone. And um, my contact information is here. It's a haggerty at acoyabio.com. Our website is on there as well. And I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Awesome. And if not, Agnes, I'll... Thank you for okay, uh, go. going through those slides. Much appreciated. Uh, great. Okay, so um, what I want to do before we jump into the next presentation today is uh, ask a couple more questions from the group here that we have. Uh, so I'm going to launch another poll. Feel free to to jump in with your answers as we as you see this rolled out. And so here's the question we would like to ask right now: What kind of tissue are you typically working with? Ah, oh, very interesting. It looks like we've got a 60% non-human, 40% human split on that. Well, that's, that's, that's cool to know. Thank you guys for, um, for sharing that. We were kind of uncertain to see if that was going to go one way or the other, but it looks like we're almost right down the middle. Oh, very cool. And then uh, I have one more question that I would like to pose to the group here before we jump into uh, Najiba's slides. Just cue that one up. Okay, this is a two-part question. And we're curious about the number of markers that you're typically using. Very interesting. Okay, it looks like most of us are in that three to four and, and sometimes up to five to nine range, but we were hoping to see that there was ambitions to move beyond that. Um, and it looks like 80% of you do have that uh, where you would prefer in your future work to, to do something between five and nine. Good to know. Thank you guys again for responding to these. and. I would like to, at this point, turn it over to Najiba. Najiba, go to take away. All right, thank you. Hi everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm Najiba, I'm the Reagent Sales Specialist for the West Region. Um, and my role here at Akoya is to essentially provide information about Opal Reagents, but also support assay development, optimization, and troubleshooting. And I have two other colleagues that have a similar role, one in the um, Southwest and the other in the Northeast. Um, so my background is in neuroimmunology, uh, specifically looking at the interaction of the innate immune system with a variety of neurodegenerative diseases, including uh, Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury, and prion diseases. And I did this primarily using bright field and fluorescent microscopy, which transitioned me to this role um, and I've been with Akoya for about 10 months. Um, and now that Agnes has explained the importance of multispectral imaging, I'm gonna take a few minutes and talk to you about our opal reagents and how they support multispectral imaging. So this schematic here um, shows you an overview of the opal workflow. Uh, and you'll notice that it starts out like a standard IHC assay where you run through the deparaffinization if you're working with F FFPE tissues. Uh, and antigen retrieval. Um, and then we start with the first set of incubations. That's the primary antibody, secondary opal HRP. And I'll talk about this a little more in a minute. The opal fluorophore. And then we use heat-induced epitope retrieval to strip off that primary and secondary antibody complex, leaving behind that opal fluorophore. And this is how we're able to multiplex with more than um, six colors at a time. And then we repeat the cycle until all targets of interest are detected, counter stain with DAPI, and then cover slip with your choice of mounting medium. Now, this workflow will be quite similar if you decide to use an auto stainer and our opal kits that you see on the bottom here are compatible with several auto stainers, including the Leica Bond RX and the Ventana Discovery Ultra, as well as other lower throughput auto stainers. And if you guys have questions about any of these, you can reach out um, either after this or during, and we can discuss that as well. Now, just a quick overview of the opal chemistry. The schematic is showing an example of the staining method. In this case, the triangles represent the antigens um, on the tissue sample, as well as the primary antibodies directed against them. So you would first come in with the primary antibody. And if you notice, these are all the same species, they're all rabbit. This is one of the biggest advantages of using teramide-based chemistry, the ability to use whichever clone of antibody you want without the worrying about cross-reactivity. You would then come in with the secondary antibody conjugated to horseradish peroxidase or HRP. 
And this is gonna catalyze a conversion of the tyramide molecules to highly reactive free radicals, which will cause the deposition of the opal fluorophore immediately and very discreetly around the antigen. Then you come in with heat-induced epitope retrieval step, which causes the dissociation of the primary and secondary antibody complex. So anything that's not bound is washed away and you're left with the opal fluorophore bound to your antigen. And again, as I mentioned before, because the primary and secondary antibody complex is removed, you can use whichever species you like, come in and repeat the process as many times as you like. Now in this schematic, I'm only showing four targets, but using opal chemistry together with our vector Polaris scanner, you can do up to eight targets on one tissue slide. Alternatively, using ACV's fluorescent RNA scope kit and our opal fluorophores, you can now do three to four RNA targets and up to two protein targets. And there's a new protocol that's been released to do just that. So just a quick overview of why opal um, and a quick summary of what I just explained to you guys. So the opal technology is based on TSA or a tyramide signal amplification. And the key word here is amplification because you're able to improve sensitivity by 10 to 100 fold. And because it's amplified, you're able to reduce exposure times. The opal reaction is also stable um, and this occurs via the covalent labeling of the targeted epitope. And in this case, the tyramide bound fluorophore is the substrate for HRP as you guys just saw. The opal technology is also widely used for both uh, protein and RNA detection, as I mentioned previously. Um, it's compatible with ACD's RNA scope, multiplex fluorescent B2 assay, among others. And one of the biggest advantages of the opal technology is that you can multiplex with the same primary antibody species. And we have fully automated protocols available for use on the BondRx on our website. Now, if you are going to be developing an assay, say with GFAP, CD11B, alpha synuclein, CD163, and CD206, so apparently you are phenotyping microglia, perhaps in a model of Parkinson's disease, and you want help putting together your assay. So what you'll want to do is make your way to our website, and I'm pulling up my pointer so I can show you this. If you go to our website and click on products, go down to Phenoptics. If you click on that, on the left, um, on the left side, you're gonna see an Opal Quick Start tool, which is essentially a tool for you to tell us what your project is, what tissue you're using, and what you wanna do. So it'll take you to this page right here where you'll go ahead and describe your sample. So the species type, the sample type, um, perhaps what type of tissue it is. And then most importantly, go through and type in the antibodies that you're gonna be using, three of which I mentioned earlier. And after that, you'll give us a little bit of your contact info and one of us, so if you're in the West region, I'll reach out to you you're in the uh, Southwest, Brenda Robertson will reach out to you. And if you're in the Northeast, Bill Kennedy will, and will help you essentially put together your panel to go through with your project. And with that, um, I can either take any questions or we can um, continue the discussion. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Nashva. very cool. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, this quick start tool is great. Uh, new addition to the website. So if you haven't had a chance to play with it yet, I would definitely encourage you to do so. Um, and I think it's a great way to, to just help folks um, work their way through some of these experiments that you might wanna try running. Okay, uh, so we have one more presentation. Um, Oliver Brabeck is gonna talk about the codec system, our ultra high plex, high parameter system. And before we jump right into that, I've got a couple more poll questions for you folks, if you wouldn't mind taking another shot at these. And uh, the first poll question is this one, and it's asking you about the PLEX level of your standard IHC work, and, and if you feel that this has been a limiting factor for you in the past. All right, that's good to know. It looks like uh, 
everybody's replying that yes, yes, uh, you know, low plex is limiting us. And, and, and of course, you know, this is what we're all about, being able to increase this plex level. So this is the type of feedback uh, that we wanted to hear, uh, much appreciated. Um, I've got two more questions I wanna ask before I turn it over to Oliver. And I'm curious about your preferred floor floors. If you wouldn't mind weighing in on that as well. Awesome, awesome. All right, looks like we have 80% of folks using Alexa dies and 20% on the Opal platform. Um, good to know, looks like we've got a little work to do there. Um, and then, so it'll be interesting to share some of the information with you all about um, Codex. Um, and before I hand it over to Oliver, I have just one more question to ask the group here. Ah, looks like this was kind of a split race. There we go. Okay. All right. So 67% feeling like uh, discovering new biomarkers is, is a good advantage. And then 33% thinking about just getting their projects done a little quicker. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for, for weighing in on these survey questions. It definitely helps us, especially in this time where it's hard for us to get out into these trade shows and have these conversations with, with everybody in the field, um, being able to ask these questions on in this format um, is certainly helpful. And before we jump over to Oliver, I do have one question uh, from the attendees. And it looks like this one will be for Najiba. How long is each primary antibody incubation? Najiba, do you wanna weigh in on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's about 30 minutes. Um, if you have an antibody that's just a low expressor and even after you've paired it with a bright fluorophore, if you're just still not getting the signal you want, you can increase that to about 45 or 60 minutes. Awesome, thank you. Okay, with that, <clears throat> I'd like to turn it over to Oliver. Oliver, go ahead, take it away. Thanks everyone for um, coming into today's session. Thanks to Agnes and Naj for the um, discussion on our Finoptics technology. So I'm gonna give the last of, of three little technical um, presentations today. And I'm gonna speak about Codex, which is the other product um, on the other technology that Akoya has. So unlike Finoptics, which is sort of mid-range plex and really high throughput and um, very clear signal with um, multispectral imaging. Codex is really high plex on a lower throughput side, um, and we don't use um, multispectral imaging, at least not yet. Um, so I'll talk about that technology with you. Um, first, a few words, also on my background. So like Agnes and Najiba, I'm also a neuroscientist. I did my, oh my, I did my undergrad and my PhD all in neuroscience. And then I went on to do a postdoc in neuroscience. And I always did a lot of imaging. So as an undergrad, I was doing a lot of epifluorescence imaging. As a graduate student, I did a lot of confocal imaging. And then as a, a postdoc, I eventually went into the world of two-photon imaging. But at the very end of my postdoc, I got into this arena of ultra-high-plex immunohistochemistry and um, FISH, with technologies like Codex and MERFISH and Visium. And that really, really got me excited because I think there's really a lot of power in, in being able to image dozens of biomarkers in a tissue sample. And Codex is um, essentially a platform that allows you to look at dozens of proteins or antigens in a tissue. So in this image here, you can see a fresh frozen brain slice from a mouse on the cerebellum. And this right now, you can see three different markers. One of them is DAPI. In yellow, you have noon, and in blue, you have synaptophysin. So everything that is um, sort of yellow or golden here are your neurons, and blue are all of the synaptic layers or the synaptic neural pill. Now, I'm toggling through the slide. I'm actually showing the exact same slice again. However, I'm just showing you different colors, different markers, collagen, SMA, and CD34 to show you the vascular compartment. So you can see in green here, those are the larger vessels of the brain because they have smooth muscle actin. And then you see the little capillary beds here with CD34 and basement membranes in yellow. And then in purple are radial glia. Going on, again, same sample, just a bit different set of markers. Again, we have synaptic markers and neurons plus vasculature, different colors, another set of markers, four now. Here, five more markers, same tissue. That's, it's very, very colorful. It's very, very beautiful. 
but the, the, the content, information content in this tissue is just, it's remarkable. So this tissue was labeled with 14 antibodies. If I think back to what I did as a PhD, I probably used 14 antibodies over the course of four or five years to describe tissues. And I wrote several papers about it. But today I can use all of these 14 antibodies in a single, uh, single tissue slice in a single experiment. To me, that is really stunning. Now, what's even better is that Codex can actually label 44 different antibodies as of the end of this year in a single tissue sample. So that means you can do immunohistochemistry with 44 different antibodies to reveal 44 antigen targets in your tissue. Same tissue and everything is at single cell resolution. So you can see these little green dots here. Those are all new. So these are all your nuclei. Everything we do is imaging based and has single cell resolution. And I'll get back to that in uh, just a minute. So for those of you who don't know, here's a brief overview of the Codex technology and how the system works. So essentially what Codex is, it's, it's a microfluidic handling device. It's this blue, little, blue and white little box here. That's about the size of a, of a small office printer. And what it does is essentially it, 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 it contains your antibodies. You can load it up with your antibodies and um, other reagents. And it connects to a microscope stage. So you can see that with that little tubing here on which your sample will be located. This gray thing here is a Keyens imager. So this is an epifluorescence imaging system that's automated. People like it because it's very much hands-off. You put your slide in there, you close the door and you push a button and it takes your images for you. Um, but the, the gist here is, if you look down here on this right-hand side, you can see a microscope stage. It's very much like a stage that, for example, you would see on a Leica. So this system is also compatible with, for example, a Leica DMI-8 essentially compatible with epifluorescence microscopy. And what Codex really is, is just a microfluidic handler that labels your tissue, that washes your tissues, that unlabels your tissue, so to speak. So how does that experiment then work? So what you do when you do a Codex experiment is you come up with an antibody panel. So for example, if you wanna st um, study different types of neurons and neurotransmitters, You'll have an antibody for neurons. You'll have one for serotonin, dopamine, glutamate, glutamate, um, V glutes, GABA, whatever you want. You can put 44 antibodies in your panel. Each one of these antibodies will be labeled with an oligo sequence. Every oligo sequence will be unique. That's the unique identifier for every antibody. Then you take them all at once and via one step staining, you, um, you incubate your tissue with the antibodies. This is about two or three hours on a bench top, but it works even better overnight. Um, that's what we do in house sometimes. So you can time your day around that. But that's really the only manual step that you have. After this point, your tissue is labeled with primary antibodies. All 40 or 44 of them are on your tissue, hopefully labeling the correct antigen. This is evidently up to the antibody. We don't produce our own antibodies. We inventory some of these pre-labeled ones, but literally these are your antibodies that you're using anyway from APCAM or CST or DACO, wherever you get your antibodies from. Now, after your tissue is labeled, has all of its antibodies on it, it goes into the machine. So at this point, the tissue is now on your stage, being imaged and the CODIS machine is handling it. And so what happens is the CODIS machine will, during the first round of imaging, this bends three different reporters. So this will be um, red, green, blue, or blue, red, purple, as you can see here, conventional wavelength fluorophores. Each of them is tagged with an oligo that then binds specifically to one type of antibody on your tissue. So once again, each antibody's oligo tag, you're gonna combine this with oligo tagged fluorophores that are put on by the machine, this is automated, and then selectively bind to the antibodies on your tissue. This allows you to look at three antigens at a time. The microscope then takes a picture. And you can see here down on the left-hand side, cycle one, that will be an image of three colors. After that image is acquired, the um, fluorophores are removed and the tissue goes back into its native state, still labeled with primary antibodies on it. The machine puts three different reporters on it now that recognize three different targets. You would see that here in cycle two, gives you a completely different image. Those reporters are then removed and the cycle repeats itself over and over again until you've revealed all of the different antibodies you were looking for. So you can see that here, cycle one, two, three, four. These are exactly the same tissue slices in the same positions on your microscope, just labeled each time with three different reporters that show you three different antigens. Now, evidently, you can put all of these data together and you can analyze them and it gives you a really, really nice rich data set 
on proteomics of distribution of certain molecules in your tissue. Nice thing about this is we don't use stripping for it. So it's very gentle on the tissue. Um, the tissue is very stable. It doesn't fall apart. We've actually done this experiment um, like that. So we, we did like 16 cycle imaging. Then we took the tissue off and we put it back on the machine the next day. And the tissue is still pristine and still looks really, really nice. So it's really important. Uh, you don't have any host to host cross reactivity. Remember, we're using oligos to um, do the secondary um, labeling. So the fluorophore comes in via an oligo. This is preferable over conventional immunohistochemistry where oftentimes you use a secondary antibody that is, for example, raised in a mouse and therefore will cross-react with mouse tissue. You don't have that problem here. That's very nice, it's very clean. And the last thing is these are all isothermal reactions. This all happens at room temperature. So no heating, no cooling involved. So it's all, all relatively straightforward. So that being said, um, one of the really important points to make about codex and that's especially to, you know, super or, or just a contrast it with to compare it to other related technologies. So for example, Nanostring has a really cool platform where you can look at protein and RNA, Visium's out there. Um, there's all kinds of um, platforms now where you can look at many, many biomarkers on your tissue. But Codex by its nature is imaging based. Like it's, it has the same optical principles as epifluorescence microscopy. And all those other technologies are, are then a bit more different, like they aspirate tissue or, or they have some you know, laser beam or, or some ion beam that looks at your tissue. But when you have an imaging-based system, you build on you know, I mean, almost a century of, of, of convention and tradition where you know, we are imaging something with a microscope. That means that we get single cell resolution. And it turns out this is very important because with codex, so you can see here, this is just another image. This is a, a cortex human tissue, um, FFPE, 22 antibodies were labeled for the, um, were put on the disc tissue. You can see in yellow, the glia, you can see in blue, the synaptic neural pill, you can see the vasculature once again, smooth muscle wrapping nicely around CD34. So all these different compartments in one image. There's, um, you know, five, six, seven layers of this here. I'm only showing you one. But being imaging based has this big advantage, again, we should not never underestimate what it means to have single cell resolution. So what you can see here is neurons in blue, and we have ZEB1 is in green, and lamin um, B1 is the nuclear envelope in red. So we actually have, um, with a 20X lens is what this image was acquired, we get a uh, resolution of about 0.4 micrometers. So that allows you to find individual cells and molecules that associate with individual cells. This then allows you to really break down your populations of cells based on what they express. So in this Tiffany um, clustering, you can see about 250,000 cells. It turns out um, a lot of cells, but there are also a lot of synaptic puncta that were clustered here. But when you look red here, you can see all of these are the, um, the cells that are expressed in noon. You can see that down here. So all of your neurons will be located over here. And because you have single cell resolution, and you can look at the expression, you can see that only your neurons are expressing things like ZEB1, or lamin B1, or H2A, um, X, for example. So these are molecules that are not often used in neuroscience. And this one, surprisingly, expresses very nicely in neurons, but not so much in glia. Look at your glial cells, you can see here very nicely in red. These are all of your um, cells that are expressing um, GFAP. So those would be your astrocytes. If you look further, you can see that CD44, for example, preferentially locates in astrocytes as this beta contained. And I can go on, but the thing really here is that for every single cell, you can imagine having 44 bits of information. It very quickly becomes very complicated, but also very exciting to think about what you can study with this platform. So um, we've, right now at the moment, we've built about a 25 to 28 plex panel for, um, for um, brain. We've tried human FFPE samples. We've tried mouse fresh frozen samples. And we know of labs that are doing um, human fresh frozen samples. We're also working on cell cultures, um, which are iPSCs, and they all seem to be working quite nicely. So these are data that are definitely very representative of what we see on a day-to-day -day basis now. And um, if you've done a lot of immunohistochemistry on the brain, and you would like to try using more markers, and I highly recommend you think about using Codex because it really, really broadens, broadens your view a little bit when you, when you put that many markers onto um, a piece of brain tissue. For example, I never thought about putting this H2AX 
antibody on it. I never had use for it, but now we're actually finding really, really interesting patterns with this all over different brain tissues. Now I'm gonna conclude my discussion with just a, a slide, sort of a tribute to how Agnes started, and that's the issue with autofluorescence. Um, it's no secret that autofluorescence is, is, is bad news. And it's also no secret that every one of us struggled with it at one point of our imaging careers. Excuse me. So what you can see here on the right-hand side, this is actually a codex experiment in its native state. Um, and this is a control experiment that we did. This is a, um, I believe, human FFP tissue. And the reason I'm showing you this is because this was acquired at um, 488 nanometer um, imaging with an uh, imaging settings. 488 is, is, is very, very contaminated with background fluorescence. There's a lot to see. So you can see just the tissue structure is highly fluorescent, but you also have these really, really, really prominent and bright spots, which are most likely lipofusin molecules, which is metabolic waste inside of neurons. This is a hallmark of, of you know, imaging brains at um, low wavelength and at low wavelengths, it's just these lipofusin molecules are everywhere. And they make it very, very difficult to interpret what you're seeing. Um, so what a lot of people do in, in the codex world is they avoid using green channels for the imaging experiment. They move into sci five or, or even like size, um, um, longer wavelengths or you know 550 also, rhodamine channel works pretty well. But what we found is that there's a relatively simple fluorescence quenching protocol that was uh, it's a combination of, of um, data that was published in these two papers. And what this involves is you take your brain tissue prior to labeling it with um, fluorophores and expose it to broad spectrum white light. And if you do that, you can see the difference. So these are serial sections from the same brain tissue, both labeled with GPAP, both at M488. The increase in signal to noise, the, the difference in, in the background fluorescence is stunning. It's really, really good. So we've been doing our codex experiment with this technology as of late. So essentially it just is one additional step where you treat your tissue and it comes out extremely clear. Again, this is human FFP tissue image of 488. This is remarkably good and even better than what I've seen with um, immunohistochemistry that I'm used to from my previous career. So you can see these little fibers in the astrocytes are crystal clear here. I didn't even adjust the contrast yet. So if, if you were gonna go off and do that, you could get a really nice image. And I, this is, these are raw data. So we, we didn't play around with them. And most, first and foremost, and very exciting to me, there's hardly any lipofusin left here. So that's really cool. Um, just one final image. What I'm showing you now is uh, the rhodamine channel. So this is ATO 550. Again, this one is a control experiment. Can see all of this noise and now evidently when you have a lot of noise or a lot of particles in your tissue and you have a system like Kian's that auto adjusts brightness and auto focus it comes distracted starts to focus on the wrong things here's something after the out of fluorescence is removed these are the nuclear envelopes so these are really minute structures in your cells you can see out of focus ones you can see in focus one this is really really nice so to those who have the inevitable question about what are you going to do about background fluorescence, go um, after these two papers, um, especially do what they're doing and, and do it all. Um, this is Psy SIF, this is a related technology, but their fluorescence quenching mythology combined with Codex is insanely powerful. And we're very, very happy about that, and it seems to work very, very nicely. So, those are the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, like, um, Agnes, here are contact, like Agnes had shown, here's some more contact info for you. So um, we obviously have customer care at acoyabio.com. If you have any regular or normal questions that are not directly related to um, Codex or general questions, let's call it that way. Or if you just want to muse about Codex or anything, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I'm always available for that kind of discussion. So thanks very much. And I hope you guys have liked what you've seen so far. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Oliver. It's uh, some great imagery. I always love to review those, those codex images. It's pretty amazing what we can do with so many colors now. Uh, so what I wanted to do at this point, um, we've had a chance to talk a little bit about all the different types of platforms that we have on offer. And I wanted to open up to the attendees uh, for questions and answers. Um, and so feel free to, to type a question into the Q&A and we'll queue that up for discussion. Okay, 
Got a couple of questions coming in. All right, here's the first one I have. It looks like this is probably for you, Oliver. Um, so what is the highest number of markers that you've seen in the field so far using the codex system? I know you said that we would maybe be able to support 45 by the end of the year, but today, what's the highest number that you've seen? Um, the highest number I've seen, the highest published number is 56. Uh, came out of Gary Nolan's lab at Stanford. Um, we do 44 at Akoya, um, but there's, as far as I know, there's no upper limit yet. We haven't. We haven't gone that far yet. 56 has been published. It's out there. Um, that's what you can see if you look for Gary Nolan's latest paper. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. We'll, we'll stick in the Codex theme here. Uh, what's the, um, is Codex, does the Codex process have any negative effects on, on the tissue? I mean, we talk about this brain tissue, especially being super precious. Uh, we know the human samples are hard to come by. Are there any negative effects to the tissue when you go through all those staining steps? With Codex? Yes, yeah, for Codex. No, so there's, again, this is, experiment is isothermal and there's no stripping involved. So we think it's rather gentle. And we've seen that people have taken it through an entire codex experiment and then removed the tissue and then done H&E staining or, or just put it back in the fridge for, I don't know what they do with it after that, but it seems to last throughout the entire codex experiment. It doesn't detach and it doesn't degrade as far as we can tell. And we've used the same tissue. So my um, colleague, Nadia, she worked apparently, and she's told me that she worked on one slice of tissue she did five different experiments on. So um, don't quote me on this, but oh, wow. it seems to be really interesting. I've never done it myself, but yeah, it's very gentle. Very cool. Um, okay, let's see here. Let's get some questions about the codex, okay. Um, how do you manage all of the data that you generate from a 40 color image. Oliver, do you want to talk a little bit about the downstream process? Um, so the data from, the, essentially the data that comes out from 40 biomarkers is, yeah, it's true, it's incredibly complex and you cannot manually deal with it. So what we have is we have what's called a processor that takes care of most of the, you know, um, very important, but somewhat menial tasks like stitching, autofluorescence, subtraction, and so on and so forth for you. So what you get at the end is like a poster size image of all of your tiles stitched together, um, everywhere it's trying to go into the best focus, um, autofluorescence is subtracted. Then at that point, when it comes to really analyzing your data, you have 40 different biomarker expressions, sometimes over a quarter million cells. We have a software that's called the Multiplex Analysis Viewer that allows you to do um, basic clustering, TISNI viewing, and um, basic data viewing for individual markers. What we also find is that a lot of users export the data into Surat or other pipelines that are common in the single cell genomics world. And it turns out that our, our data are easily written for that. So um, it's very easy to use some SCRNA sec pipelines to cluster your data even further or to do UMAPs or to sneeze. So it's a combination of softwares, but we basically have a basic um, outfit that should get you your first two figures out of an entire data set. Great, great. Thank you, Oliver. Okay, I have a couple more questions. Um, this one doesn't seem to be um, specific to either one. Am I locked into the antibodies that your company cells, I guess the ones that we as a Koya have on our shelf or, or do we have some freedom there? I don't know, Naj, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so for either platform, the answer is no. So for Phenoptics, for using Opals, um, you know, one of the biggest advantages that I mentioned is you can use any, any antibody that you like, any species that you like. Um, generally, if you have an antibody clone that works well with DAB, we find that it transfers well to um, opal staining as well. Uh, for Codex, we do have an, a list of inventoried antibodies um, that are already conjugated to specific barcodes. So you have an option of using that. Um, another option is custom conjugating uh, your preferred antibodies to um, 
are barcodes. Uh, we do have a list of screened antibodies that we've um, validated to work with the to work well with the codex system. Um, so you have you can use that. Um, we also have a list of what we call community antibodies, um, and these are also for custom conjugation, but they've been tested by other users. And again, we know them to um, translate well when you uh, conjugate when you custom conjugate them. But yeah, there's really no limitation. Um, if you have an antibody that is preferred, you know what works well um, with either chromogenic IHC with DEB or uh, fluorescent microscopy, you can custom conjugate it to our barcodes. Awesome, thank you, Najwa. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another question. Um, I think this one is for, for Oliver. How long does it take for one cycle of binding, imaging, and stripping of the fluorophores? Uh, depends on how many um, depends on how many markers you have, how big the region of interest that you're going to set up. But uh, as an example, let me let's assume that you're going to image something that is 3.5 times 2.5 millimeters. Uh, that's the dimension of your sample, and you're going to have about 38 antibodies. So the fluidics time for this will be 35 minutes per cycle. And then your imaging with the newest configuration of codex should be about 15 to 20 minutes, um, depending on how you set it up per cycle. So you're going to come in at around 45 to 50 minutes per cycle, and then give you three fluorophores. So all in, you're looking for 38 um, antibodies uh, at 3.5 times 2.5 millimeters. You're looking at about a 10 hour experiment. So perfect overnight thing to do. Hmm. Cool. Okay. That's great. Uh, okay, looks like we've run through our list of questions and we're almost at the top of the hour. Uh, so I think this is probably a good point for us to wrap it up. I wanna thank first off our three neuroscientists from Akoya for joining and sharing their experiences today. And then also thank you guys for uh, all of our attendees who came in and um, answered our poll questions and, and contributed to this discussion. Like I said at the top, uh, this is a bit of a new format that we wanted to try out and get a little bit more interaction. Uh, so we're, we're really pleased um, with the results and, and thank you guys again. And if you have any questions at all, um, feel free to reach out. You can hit us up at customer care or uh, you can hit us up directly with those email addresses that we shared. And with that, uh, I'll bid everybody a good day. Talk soon, take care.